The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. Welcome to Garden Connections. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. We have a beautiful and serene show for you today. We start by visiting the Dan Abraham Healthy Living Center in Rochester, where we learn about their stunning living wall. Next, we walk through the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum's Japanese Garden with horticulture manager Tom Brinda. And Chef Stephen Larson prepares stir-fried broccoli with red miso and walnut sauce for us. It's going to be a great show. Stay with us. Garden Connections is next. We're here at the Dan Abraham Healthy Living Center, and our special guest today is Dr. Donald Hensrud, who is the medical director of the program. Welcome to Garden Connections. Happy to be here. So this is an amazing space, and we're going to talk specifically about the living wall in just a minute, but I would love to have folks know a little bit more about what you do here. Everybody knows that staying healthy is important, but the problem is sustaining those changes over time. The Mayo Clinic Healthy Living Program helps people design an individualized wellness plan in the areas we all know are important, <laughs> physical activity, nutrition, and what we call resiliency, our ability to manage and grow from life's challenges. Okay. That includes many mind-body areas, and the living wall, we think, is part of that experience. Great. Well, tell us how this living wall helps you meet that mission, helps you accomplish some of those goals. It's a symbolism, I think, with nature, with outside. It's living. It's growing. Mm -hmm. And so these plants are resilient. They, they uh, tell us about life, as does all the light and space that we have in the building. Sure. Life's not static, is it? Exactly. All right. So you have this on one of your upper floors in this building. What do people do when they come into this space? This is a place that people can come and, and be by themselves. They're very busy in the program. If they want some solitude, it's a great place just to hang out and, and to get their thoughts together okay. with the company of the plants. Great. Is there any medical research? I mean, those of us who garden always are convinced that plants are good for our health. Is there any research that backs that up? I suspect there is. But to us, this is one area we are evidence-based in many areas, but this is one area that we thought this just makes sense. It's a good environment, and sure. I'm sure the research is there, but it just feels right. Feels right. And what kind of response have you been getting from the patients or the people that are coming in and using the facilities? Very positive response. People see this and they just light up. It's, it, it tells them, it reinforces the things we're trying to teach them mm -hmm. to help them incorporate in their lives, and it's very enjoyable for people. Great. How can folks learn a little bit more about what you have to offer here? Is there a website we should send them to, or how can they get a sense of how they can participate in what you're trying to accomplish here? There is a website, healthyliving.mayoclinic.org. It talks about the Healthy Living Program and uh, people can find out anything they want. MailClinic.org is our general website for general health information. Mm -hmm. Great. So this is a gigantic wall. It's almost 50 feet long, is that right? That's correct. With many different plants and things in it. What do you suggest to folks? They come here and they find peace and they find it very restful, but they can't kind of pick up the wall and take it home with them. Well, what recommendations do you have We're trying to folks? help people incorporate many different health habits in their lives. And as you pointed out, I or nobody else can take the wall home or have one in our homes, right. but we can have plants around. Mm -hmm. and that uh, surrounds us with life and gives us, uh, uh, helps with our purpose and meaning in life, we think. Great. Well, Dr. Hensford, thank you so much for showing this beautiful wall to It's a great addition to this facility. Thank you very much. Well, stay with us. We are going to send you out to the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum next, where we learn about the Japanese garden. When we return here, Chris Rosenbush is going to tell us specifically what plants are included in this wall. More Garden Connections is coming up. Tom, the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum is such an amazing place. There's so many gardens, there's so much to see here. Tell us a little bit about everything that is encompassed in this facility. Well, Stephanie, the University of Minnesota Landscape Arboretum is now over 1,100 acres, 
and between the native wetlands, the prairie restorations, the gardens, and the rare book library, there's something for everyone here. That is for sure. I love this place. How long has it been here? Well, the first gardens were built in the 1980s, and this garden that we're in, the Garden of Pure Water, was built in 1985. 1985. And the Garden of Pure Water is a Japanese garden. It is. Is that correct? It is. Uh, the master planners hired uh, the Japanese landscape architect Koichi Kawana. He was then a professor at UCLA and designing gardens around North America. So he came here and got the essence of the site and made the decisions for how the garden was to be designed. All right. So are there some key design elements that should be considered in this garden? Obviously the plants Obviously. are different, but let's talk about design elements a little bit. What should be included in a Japanese garden? Well, Mr. Kawana said that Japanese gardens are not reproductions of nature, rather they express the essence of nature. So if we think about nature in Minnesota, we think of pines, we think of water, our 10,000 lakes, we think of beautiful rock outcroppings like on Lake Superior and along the river, and all of those essences are here in this garden. So a Japanese garden isn't necessarily, I mean, the plants and the features that you see here aren't a reflection of Japan. They really should be a reflection of where you are. Am I understanding that correctly? That's right. And the philosophy then develops from that. So Mr. Kawana was very clear that he wanted to use a combination of Asian plants and North American plants in this garden. And then the garden is designed to the scale of the space that is here. Sounds great. Well, let's talk about some of the plants we have here. Some of them are flowering and they look beautiful. Tell us what, what we're seeing. Well, the flowering plants are actually seasonal focal points. And so at some times of the year, like spring, when you're here today in May, you'll see the, the lilacs and the azaleas. Other times of the year, you'll see it almost completely green with all the clipped hedges that are combinations of boxwoods. And then in the fall of the year, the maples come in and blaze and we go into the fall with the seasonal changes. And actually one of the most beautiful times of the year is in the winter when the frost and the snow layers all these plants and shows their forms off. The structure is really, I mean, of the, of the plants, the structure, I, I think of these beautiful trees behind us, they're just pretty to look at. I mean, the, the branches and how they curve and really is an amazing feature here. And what you probably realize is that when Mr. Kawana placed these plants, he did so so that each character of the branches was expressed. And then over the years, since 1985, our horticulture staff has been crafting and developing the forms of these plants to see what you're seeing today. So it's almost completely manipulated, but it has that natural essence. Right, right. One of the plants I found interesting is this one here at our feet. It looks like it's a hardwood, and yet you can see it's so low and has been appears to be a, trimmed quite tight. What, what is this plant, and, and what kind of maintenance is required for something like this? Well, the plant that you're looking at is the Japanese barberry. So that is one of the Asian plants that is here in this garden. Mm -hmm. And the clipping is something that takes place almost weekly. Some section of the garden is clipped almost every week. Okay. And the staff and the volunteers together work on this year round in order to have this beautiful, natural, but completely maintained and contrived garden. Great, looks terrific. Well, I would love to have us talk a little bit more about the water feature, so let's get a little closer, shall we? Sure. things I want to talk about before we talk about this beautiful water feature are the stones in the path. You, you really have to kind of pay attention where you're going here because it's not like a flat sidewalk and I would assume there is a purpose to that. That's right because this garden has to do with contemplation and the thoughtfulness of nature and if we approach this as our typical American lifestyle where we are racing through a garden go, go, it's go. not the right mood. So these are very deliberately placed so that they're stepping stones and I call them garden speed bumps <laughs> because they're supposed to slow us down as we come into the garden. And they do, they're a little uneven so you do kind of want to watch the step and even the tops of some of these stones are not exactly flat. Right. Now you had a couple that we walked across that were straight, they were more rectangular in shape and they seemed a little out of place but, but tell me the story about those. Well there's a symbolism that has to do with the garden spirits and if you don't want those spirits in uh, then you have them staggered like that. The paving stones are staggered. If they're straight, then the spirits go right along with them. Oh, very interesting. So we have this beautiful waterfall in the background with a pond and everything, and a water feature seems to be common throughout many Japanese garden or Jan Japanese landscape environments. Tell us about this particular feature. It's really striking. Well, Mr. Kawana was thinking about Minnesota 
and nature in Minnesota. And so as he selected the stones, he was blending the Japanese philosophy as well as our Minnesota themes. And so if we look across the water, we see symbolisms that are represented here. And again, pulling from the Japanese philosophy. So the symbolism of the water is the ocean and the island in the middle is the symbol of a tortoise, which has okay. to do with longevity and happiness. And then there's even a couple of ships out there in the form of rocks. The big rocks. Again, part of the symbolism of it. That's wonderful. And the sound, is to, there's something about water that sounds so soothing and so tranquil. Absolutely. And we have a beautiful waterfall there. Our horticulturist who cares for this garden says that our own Minneapolis's Minnehaha Falls was the inspiration for the shape and the right. fall of the garden. Love that reflection of the local as well. Now when people come to this garden you fully expect them to, as you said, kind of take their time, just absorb all the things that are here. You also have a lovely shelter that people can sit and relax and just be. Typically do you find that people spend a lot of time here in the garden more so than some of the others that you have? There are folks who come and use this garden for contemplation. Many times these are the guests who have enjoyed this garden before and they find this place as a place for meditation and solace. There are other folks who are coming with children and the children love the koi fish that are here oh, sure. and the sculptures that are in the garden. So it sort of depends on the visitors and what their purpose is of being here. Some spend a lot of time, some see it quickly and move on to other interesting places at the Landscape Arboretum. Sure. Now you've got this really interesting tower kind of hidden behind that tree back there. Is there symbolism that's tied to that as well? There are, and these are lanterns that are meant to light your way through the garden. Mm -hmm. Although this is not normally open at nighttime, mm -hmm. if we were to do that, there are stone lanterns that are done in a traditional way and, and placed in a traditional way so we could light the garden in your nighttime pathway. Great. Well, it sounds like this garden requires quite a bit of upkeep. You talked about trimmings just about every day. How, how do you accomplish that here? I understand you have quite a few volunteers and then you've, they're under the direction of someone who cares specifically for this garden. That's true. Mary Bigelow is one of the horticulturists and Jewel Ingstrom is the other and they care for this garden in conjunction with other staff members, students and volunteers. And because it takes daily care and really they turn into stewards of this garden. And so since 1985, there is this careful trimming and shaping the pine trees particularly are probably the most intricately done. Mm -hmm. The others are then sheared and that's done a couple times a year. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the design is to include Minnesota elements and so there are Minnesota plants in here. For those that aren't native, uh, is there any challenge with our Minnesota winters? Well there is and this year particularly the Japanese red pines have been browned or damaged by the coldest winter in 100 years yeah. and oh, so since 1985 one. there has been some other years where there's been a little bit of damage but this is the most severe so the plants are all leafing out and we're very hopeful that they will recover completely but if you can think about trimming these yearly since 1985 it's really heartbreaking for everyone who is a gardener whether it's their own home garden mm -hmm. or a public garden like this one to have damage to plants. Like so if you're looking for a wonderful, peaceful place to spend the afternoon, I highly recommend this garden. Tom, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and letting us come. I'm looking forward to enjoying this a little bit more this afternoon. It's my pleasure to have you in the Garden of Pure Waters. Thank you. Stay tuned for more Garden Connections. On Garden Connections, we'd love to see photos of your garden. Or if you have questions for our garden experts, contact us by emailing garden at ksmq.org or like us on Facebook. We're here at the Dan Abraham Healthy Living Center and we've been talking about this beautiful living wall and we're gonna get up close and personal to it and learn a little bit more about the specific plants that are in here. And to help us with that, we have Master Gardener Chris Rosenbush. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, yes, thanks for having me. So you're gonna help us understand what these plants are and a little bit on how to care for them. Right. So let's start out by talking about specific plants. So tell us the kinds of plants that might work in this and, and what they've chosen here for us today. So this is a beautiful, dark, I love the color contrast for right. this one. So, so that's a burgundy rubber plant. Um, so it's a rubber yeah, plant, like the kind, plant. the big tall yes. ones that you'd see yep. on the floor. So if you planted this out in a room, it could grow to be very tall. Okay. When you have a vertical arrangement, are, are they trimming this then to keep it they this size? They would be trimming it, yes. Okay. They'll be trimming it. And you also notice the pot sizes. You can't see them out there, but if you look really close, you can see the pots are small, so that will help, help too, to kind of keep the them from growing. Because if you plant it in a bigger pot, obviously it's going to be able to expand right. and grow. Okay. So rubber plant, and then we have, I love this one because it provides great yeah. depth and it's kind of fun. and. 
This is a dr uh, dwarf Schefflera, and it's actually considered an evergreen. Really? Yeah, so it's a dwarf plant, um, tropical by nature. Mm -hmm. If you planted this outside in the tropics, it could grow like 10, 20 feet wow. tall. Very yeah, so. Huge. Okay, yep. so let's Very keep going pretty. down the wall. This one looked familiar to me. Tell me if I'm right. Is this a philodendron? That is correct. Okay. Yep, Hartley philodendron. Um, again, another great uh, house plant that you could have anywhere in your house. This one, though, you would want to keep up. It can be toxic if ingested. So little kids, pets that might eat the plant, we would keep definitely want reach. to keep that out of reach. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember my mom had some of these, and it seemed like they got long and spindly, and some of her friends had them, and they'd wrap them around things. They do. Is, is that the way you, I mean, this looks so compact and neat. If you want them to be compact in the middle, you want to trim the vines. Okay. So as the vines shoot out, you'll want to trim those and then that will make your middle full so you have more of a full plant. Okay, mm -hmm. yep, they do get a little spindly once they, they do. go yeah. out and about. And then we have this great, almost spiky one in here. What's this right, one Right, so this is a dwarf Janet Craig and you will see these a lot of times. Uh, people will use these in their um, like aquarium settings, not in like a fish aquarium, but for lizards or other kinds oh. of things like that, you will see those. Okay. Um, and they can grow, this is a dwarf plant, but they can also grow. Go fairly ahead. tall. Large as mm -hmm. well. So you mentioned that some of these are tropical. Right. D is that what makes them suitable for being a house plant? Because they need that warmer constant temperature. Tell us a little bit about kind of how do we maintain the health of some of these plants. Right. So generally the plants on this wall are tropical by nature. So they do prefer a warmer humid climate. Um, they really all are easy to grow and maintain. So even somebody with a brown thumb could do it, <laughs> you know? So um, they like that medium to bright light. East facing windows are really good for that. Okay. They don't like to be in the direct sunlight because that can scorch the leaves or fade color. So like on the burgundy mm -hmm. um, rubber plant that we were looking at earlier, that if it's placed in direct, or if that one's placed in a low light situation, it will fade to green. So it will lose that burgundy oh, color. So okay. that's where they so like that, that medium, yep, that light, more light, you want that light. Okay. Um, there are a couple other ones that do fairly well in low light, mm -hmm. like the neon pothos behind you. Okay, yep, um, okay, this is this great, one. almost chartreuse. This is Neon's great. a good color Yeah, and you know what, great for an office or a dorm mm -hmm. where you don't get a lot of natural light, okay. usually. Mm -hmm. so, so it would survive a little bit better. And this is related, you said this. Um, these, this one, yeah. uh, this is uh, nephitis, and it's actually related to this one to down this one. here. Okay. So yep. this is you a can white see the butterfly. Leaf shape is yep. similar. Nephthitis, and this is a pink nephthitis, and they're both they also called an arrowhead plant, um, obviously because of the leaf because shape. Of the shape of the leaf. Yep. All of these plants actually uh, prefer to be watered thoroughly and then have time to dry out in between your watering. Okay, so you don't want to necessarily keep the soil moist all right. the time. You want to give them a little breathing room. Right. If the soil's too wet, you could develop root rot. Hmm. or you're gonna get yellowing of leaves or the leaves might drop mm -hmm. and you know obviously that could kill the plant. Yeah. Um, is it too late once you see either it wilting because it's too dry or turning yellow because it's too wet or do you want to stick your finger in the dirt? Definitely stick your finger in the dirt and do that kind of test to mm -hmm. see. If they're yellowing, I would just stop the watering probably and let it dry out, let that mm -hmm. soil dry out and then you can start back with the watering again and just okay. make sure it waters and the water drains through. So when you're mm -hmm. planting these, we want to plant them in well-draining soil. Right. So, so the potting sure soil, that. make sure it can yep. the water can come out and they're not sitting in water. Right. If they're drooping because they need water, mm -hmm. these plants, once you water them, they'll perk right back up. Right back up. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's a quick fix. Unless it's been a, you know, an extended period of time and the right. leaves are turning brown, then I'm not sure. If, so if they recover. It, yeah. Right. So I've always heard you should repot your house plants every now and again. Do you recommend that and how often should you do that? And do you always have to go up in size in a pot? What if you've got you know, this perfect space in your house and you want a plant that's this big? Mm -hmm. Is repotting still of benefit? Yes, you can, yeah, you can repot. Um, it depends to, like you said, if you want to keep it to the same size, sometimes these plants will get very root bound. Mm -hmm. And so by repotting and giving them the new soil, that gives them some new nutrients, especially if you um, are just watering. Another thing to do with these plants is to maybe add some nutrition okay. to their water. Sure. Okay. So as they get bigger and they require more requirements from vitamins, minerals that they've already depleted from the soil that's right. in the pot. Kind of refreshes can, it a little bit. Yes, yeah, so the repotting would help with that. If some of these ones that grow larger, are they dividable? Or do you really just want to take that root ball and maybe 
cut that so because the root bound can't be good for it in the pot. Right. Some of these plants you can divide. Um, I think there some of uh, some of them will be sensitive to that mm -hmm. okay. too. Right. So it so just, just maybe depends. Check it out. Yeah. See which ones. I would say before you split anything or divide anything, maybe just take a little time to look it up and research what you're doing so you know when the best time of the month is or best time of the year is to replant. To make that change. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, let's keep going. We've got this beautiful neon. Yep. And way up top, we've got kind of a uh, almost a spotted That's a, leaf. Um, called a silver satin pothos, and that one is actually related to oh the neon pothos right here. Okay. So, yep. So, so those two are plant, related. Just a different variety. Yes. Great. Sounds good. When people are picking out a house plant, mm -hmm. they're going to want to add something uh, to their home. Where is the best place? You can. You know, it seems like house plants are even in gift shops these days. Or right. you know, do you have to go to a nursery? You don't. I mean, you can find house plants. Uh, a lot of these at your big box stores. Mm -hmm. um, you can go to a nursery or a florist mm -hmm. and get them there. You just want to look for a nice, healthy plant that's got good color in its leaves. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't look and these all like look great. It's, <laughs> these all look great. Right. These all look great. So yeah. So really, just looking for a nice color, nice sheen to the leaf, mm -hmm. um, and then just if the soil is moist but not wet, but not wet. or well drained. Yeah. Those are good things to look mm -hmm. for. Great. Well, thank you for helping us yes. get an up-close look and finding out exactly what's in this beautiful living wall. Appreciate your time. Yes, thank you. Stay with us. We are next going to visit with Chef Stephen Larson at the Quarter Quarter Restaurant. He's going to be making a stir-fried broccoli with red miso and walnut sauce dish. I think you'll like it. Back when my wife Lisa and I had our cooking school out on our farm, one of the favorite classes that we ended up doing both for ourselves and our guests was homestyle Japanese. So that's the inspiration for this next recipe. Uh, it's going to be broccoli with a red miso or brown miso uh, and walnut sauce or dressing. So to make that, we need some miso. Now, miso is a fermented rice and soybean paste that's very, very big in Japanese cooking. You can kind of think of it as a building block of flavor that they use in many, many dishes. So we're going to use a tablespoon of red miso and a half a cup of toasted walnuts. And we're going to put that into the food processor, along with a bit of soy sauce, about a tablespoon of that, a tablespoon of mirin or sweet sherry, some sort of uh, cooking wine, and then three tablespoons of dashi. Now, dashi is a Japanese soup stock that's made with uh, dried tuna flakes and seaweed. It sounds strange to us in America here, but it has a rich, savory, um, very mouthwatering quality, and it's really terrific in these recipes. So we'll add that. And we'll just give it a quick spin. Scrape that down. Give it just a bit more. And this doesn't need to be totally smooth. A little bit of texture is actually quite good with that. All right, so now for the broccoli, we're just going to blanch that very quickly in boiling water. And I've got my pan set up here to where we can put that in. And we are going to give that not even a minute. I mean, we want some texture there. We want it to have a good, crisp, very fresh, very green flavor to it. And to finish the dish, we'll just put the dressing in the bowl here. And when the broccoli is done, we're going to toss it in the dressing. Okay, I'm just going to feel that. Still got some texture. That's perfect. I'm going to shut that off. 
And we want to drain it really well, otherwise it's going to water down the dressing. Give that a very good shake. And in it goes. Finish that up by putting it into a nice serving bowl because you know what they say, you taste with your eyes first. So making things pretty is a very important part of a chef's job. To garnish, a little bit more of chopped walnuts. And there we have broccoli with red miso and walnut sauce because, you know, putting a little Japanese in your life is a good thing. Well, I can assure you that recipe was fantastic. You can find all our recipes from Chef Larson segments on our website, ksmq.org, or check us out on Facebook. We'll post them there as well. So I hope you enjoyed today's show. I hope you found some peace and tranquility from some of the places that we've shown you. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham for Garden Connections. I hope to see you next time. Thank you.